Welcome back everyone. So this week we're going to be talking about sexual behaviors, um, the evolutionary basis, hormonal, and also neural basis of sexual behavior. Sexual behavior is a topic that is of interest to most of us, and yet it's also a very taboo topic um, that leads to it being rather understudied. It also has led to research getting a rather late start on it, as we'll discuss. It's really quite perplexing when you think about it, um, because it's a natural behavior that has so great psychological interest. Um, I mean, it brings people together, it brings new life into the world, and unfortunately can rip relationships apart. Um, so given this, it's odd that it's somewhat ignored compared to other areas of research. However, we will not follow in this trend. We will delve into the topic because it is of great importance to people in their lives. For those of you who are thinking about going into private practice, if you have trouble talking about sets, now is a really good time to start practicing. It comes up in therapy a lot, and a competent psychologist has to be able to handle it. So, Sexual behavior is often broken down into four main behaviors, sexual attraction, appetitive behavior, copulation, and post-copulatory behavior. So, sexual attraction is the first step in the mating behavior of many animals. Here, the animal emits stimuli that attract members of the opposite sex. An example of this can be a male peacock strutting his stuff, or people dressing to be noticed at the club. The goal here is to attract the attention of a member of the opposite sex. Civil factors seem to come into play. Uh, those who look more physically healthy uh, and thus more likely to produce healthy offspring often are perceived as more attractive. Also, another thing is people who... Um, symmetry seems to be important with attraction, so faces that are more symmetrical are, are also perceived as more attractive. Um, but also there are some aspects of attraction that can be learned, which is why fashion, for instance, is important. So it's not just um, it's not just the physical. Obviously, there are other learned behaviors that go into sexual attraction. Okay, so we dress for success, and we actually got noticed by a member of the opposite sex. Great. So what's next? Well, now we have our appetite of behaviors. So these are behaviors that help establish or maintain sexual interaction. So a female exhibiting these behaviors is said to be proceptive. Thus, um, probably the simp simplest way to explain this is an appetite of behavior is meant to signal interest in taking things to the next level. This could be suggestive glances, accidental touches, you know, accidental touches, um, holding hands, hugging, you get the idea. Now I know what you're thinking. What on earth is he going to have as a picture for copulation? Don't worry, I thought about this. So here you go. So copulation is the actual sexual act. The book has pictures of rats, so I thought I'd stick with the animal theme without being too graphic, but you get the idea. In most species, copulation only occurs when the female is sexually receptive, i.e. in heat, um, or most likely to be fertile. Humans are the exception to this, as there's actually very little correlation for humans between sexual behavior and fertility. So, getting down to the act, the actual process of the male inserting the penis into the female is called intromission, which is followed by copulatory stimulation, usually through pelvic thrusting. Then it reaches the threshold level, and at that point the male ejaculates semen and often goes into a refractory phase. The refractory phase is a period following orgasm with during which an individual cannot recommence copulation. Women do not have a refractory phase, which makes multiple orgasms possible, whereas most, but not all men, seem to have this. The refractory period varies between individuals, and it also depends on circumstances. For example, the Coolidge effect states that in many animals, um, the animal will resume copulatory behavior sooner if provided with a new partner. Not that I actually recommend that for humans. But. 
Lastly, there are post-copulatory behaviors. These vary, vary widely by species, as you can see in the cartoon. I love this cartoon. Um, these vary by species. Um, in some species, such as dogs, you can actually see something that's called copulatory lock, which is where the male's penis actually swells so much that it cannot be removed for about 10 to 15 minutes. It is thought that this may be done in order to help ensure paternity. Um, Post-copulatory behavior also includes uh, parental behaviors, which is where adult anim or which is where an adult animal behaves in a way that enhances the well-being of their own offspring, often at their own cost. So thus, post-copulatory behaviors can actually continue long after copulation. This isn't just talking about the minutes after. This is talking about after copulation, long-term, what happens. So it's including all those parental behaviors. So if the stars align and the woman is ovulating, then um, fertilization can occur. So internal fertilization takes place inside the woman's body. Here you have a fusion of gametes, which is just a fancy word for a sperm and an egg. Um, and it results in a fertilized ovum, also known as a zygote. This process occurs in mammals, birds, um, and reptiles. Some species have external fertilization instead of internal. In external fertilization, the eggs are fertilized outside of the female's body. Uh, this is often found in waterbound creatures such as fishes and frogs, which just release their gametes into the water. So thus you have to be careful with where you swim. So. What happens with castration? Well, as you can imagine, when an animal is castrated, you see a significant change in sexual behavior, which, again, made sense because many sexual behaviors are driven by part, um, in part by the gonadal hormones, so the hormones that come from the gonads. In male rats, following castration, there are no more ejaculations after a, for, after a couple of weeks, and they'll eventually stop mounting the female receptive rats. However, if you give them testosterone, the behaviors resume. Thus, it appears that testosterone is an important um, hormone for this relationship. This increase in behavior due to giving a hormone is called an activational effect. It doesn't take much testosterone to regulate sexual behaviors. In fact, research has shown that one-tenth of the amount of testosterone that is normally produced is enough to maintain full mating behavior in rats. In women, estrogen is very important. For one, it facilitates the um, ovulation cycle, which is obviously important for fertility. Low levels of estrogen also cause menopause symptoms. Much like men, however, these effects can be ameliorated or lessened through introducing hormones, particularly estrogen and progesterone. That is why estrogen and pro progesterone are often used in hormone replacement therapy, which is a therapy in which the effects of menopause are reduced through giving hormones. In addition to reducing menopause symptoms, hormone replacement therapy um, does have some in significant side effects that are worth talking about. Um, there's evidence showing that it may, um, well, on the positive side, it may increase longevity and reduce the risk of dementia. However, why it's controversial is there's some evidence that hormone replacement therapy may increase the risk of breast cancer, heart attacks, and strokes. So the data is still kind of mixed on it. It certainly helps, but the long-term effects are more debated still. So we'll talk a little bit more about pheromones um, in the next video, but I just wanted to talk briefly, you know, touch them on, touch on them at the end of this video. So, pheromones are um, chemical signals that are released outside the body of an animal that affects members of the same species. So, dog urine has pheromones, in which, which is part of the reason why male members will use urine to mark their territory. It's chemicals that communicate to other dodge and this is my space. So while it's used for things like this, 
Pheromones can also signal sexual readiness within an animal and it provides this information between animals so other members of that set, um, of that species rather, are aware. So that's why if you have a female dog in heat, it affects all the other dogs in the neighborhood, all the male dogs, because they can detect those pheromones. So we'll get into that a little bit more in the next video lecture.